Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ronald Coleman and Edna Best in A Tale of Two Cities. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. So Charles Dickens described the world as it was in the time of his story, A Tale of Two Cities. But for the Lux Radio Theater, it certainly is the best of times when we can bring you this thrilling drama with a star like Ronald Coleman and with Edna Best as his leading lady. While Dickens was writing A Tale of Two Cities, he tells us he had a great desire to play the leading part himself. But if he could have known how Ronald Coleman would play it, I'm sure he'd gladly have given up his own ambition. You'll hear Ronnie tonight as Sidney Carton, with Edna Best as Lucy Manette, in this roaring drama of adventure in the days of the French Revolution. A story of love and sacrifice, marching to the rhythm of the reign of terror. A Tale of Two Cities is one of those rare stories that achieve immediate success and yet hold their popularity over the years. That's the true test of real value. And there's a very close parallel in a story not of two cities, but of six continents, the story of Lux Toilet Soap. You know, a famous critic once wrote of Dickens that he had risen like a rocket and would come down like a stick. And the next time the two met, Dickens said, I will watch for that stick, sir, and when it comes down, I will break it across your back. But he never carried out his threat because the stick never came down. The rocket is still going up. And so is the popularity curve of Lux Toilet Soap. It's been my experience that the public never lets real value down, whether that value is literary or Lux. Now we turn back the clock 150 years to A Tale of Two Cities, as the curtain goes up on the first act, starring Ronald Coleman as Sidney Carton and Edna Best as Lucy Manette, with Hallowell Hobbs as Mr. Lorry and Dennis Green as Donnie. Paris, 1793. The French Revolution is over. The cause is won. But the bloodshed has only started. The reign of terror sweeps through the land in all its fury. And each day, Madame la Guillotine is fed her share of human life. The dripping blade rises and falls. And the crowd counts in monotonous rhythm as each noble head rolls to the ground. The knife rises again and sweeps downward. Twenty-two! Twenty-two lives in a single day, and more to come, and more, and more, until nightfall draws a curtain on the scene. Behind the bleak walls of La Force prison, the doomed of the following day await their fate. In a bare dungeon cell, a single lantern throws a ghostly glow on their faces. With a rattle of chains, the great iron door is thrown open. Everyone rise. Rise, aristocrats. In the name of the people of France, it is hereby declared by order of the tribunal that the 52 prisoners now interned in La Force prison shall be put to death by the guillotine on no. the morning of February 2nd, oh, 1793. No. Oh, no. Citizen jailer, which one of these is Charles Evremont? Evremont, step forward. Evremont! Charles Evremont, call Charles Dornay. Which one of you is he? I am Evremont. Step forward. Charles Evremont, known as Charles Dornay. The tribunal has a special treat in store for you. In view of the excitement occasioned by your trial, it was felt that some small favor would be in order. We have decided, therefore, that you shall live long enough to witness the execution of your friends. Fifty-one heads will fall tomorrow. Yours will be the fifty-second. Oh, no. oh, no. 
Citizen Evermont. Yes? I didn't know you were here with us. It's so dark. I know. What is it you want, please? Oh, don't you know me? I'm Lisette, the seamstress. We were brought to La Force together. Oh, yes, of course. I... I forget for the moment of what you were accused. They accused me of plotting. But I'm innocent, I swear. How could I plot against the Republic? I'm nothing. I'm no one. Don't cry, child. It's too late for tears. I try to be brave, but soon the morning will come. It's growing light even now. You have an hour yet, perhaps more. Ask God for courage. Look, the sun is rising. I'm afraid, and yet I'm glad. At least we can see again. We can... What is it? You. You're not Evermont. You're not Charles oh, Evermont. Quiet. You... quiet. I knew Charles Evermont. His eyes were blue. Yours are brown. His hair was light, and yours... Who are you? Like you, I am nobody. But you are going to die for him. Why, monsieur? I could never make you understand. But I could set you free. One word oh, from me and... It... You can't do that. You mustn't. Please. Tell me about yourself. Oh, how can I? It would help so if you talked to me. Perhaps it would help you too, monsieur. There's so much to tell. It all began long ago. When? Twenty-five years ago, 1768. Have you ever been in England? No, never. There's a long hill on the Dover Road that sweeps down to the sea. It's a pleasant road on a summer day with the sun shining. But the devil's own highway at night in the winter rain. On just that sort of night, in 1768, a coach topped the rise of the hill, the mail bound east for Dover. Come on, come on, get up, come on, get up, get up, get up, get up! Top of the hill, Tom. Better rest him for a moment. Oh, oh. We'll be lucky if we make the boat for Calais this night. Shh, listen. Hear that? What do you say? I say a horse at a canter coming up the hill after I us. say a horse at a gallop. Ho oh, there! Stand or I'll fire! Who are you? What do you want? Is that the Dover Mail? I want a passenger, if it is. What passenger? Mr. Jarvis Lorry. Keep where you are. Is there a gentleman named of Jarvis Lorry in the coach? I'm Lorry. Who wants me? It's me, Mr. Lorry, Jerry. Oh, I know this messenger, guard. There's nothing wrong. I hope there ain't. Hello, you. Come on at a foot pace. Well, Jerry, what is it? A dispatch, sir, sent after you from London. Be quick about reading it, sir. I don't like this. Oh, it's not very long, you see. Wait at Dover for Mademoiselle. Oh, very good, very good. Uh, Jerry? Yes, Mr. Lorry? Write back to London as fast as you can. Tell them my answer was, recall to life. Recall to life. That was Mr. Lorry's business that night to recall to life a man who had been buried alive for 18 years, a prisoner of the French nobility. But the man had escaped and was now hidden by friends in the village of Saint Antoine. To that village went Mr. Lorry, to the wine shop of a certain Madame Defarge. You are Madame Defarge? I am. You wish some wine, monsieur? Uh, my name is Jarvis Lorry. I've just arrived from London. This young lady with me is Miss Lucy Manette. Good morning, Mademoiselle. Please tell us, is my father here? Is he safe? Your father? There is no one here, Mademoiselle. But Mr. Lorry was told uh, that... One moment, my child. Madame Defarge, perhaps I should have presented my credentials sooner. Recall to life. There is a man here. A man old beyond his years. A mender of shoes. Will you come this way? My husband and I have kept him locked in a room upstairs. Did you say locked? Yes. Of his own desire? Of his own necessity. He has lived too long alone. He would be afraid if his door was left unlatched. Oh, Mr. Lorry, I'm frightened. Hush, my dear. Father. Good day, Dr. Manette. You are hard at work, I see. Yes, I am working. You have a visitor, Dr. Manette. Show him the shoe you are working at. Now, 
tell him, monsieur, the maker's name. Do you ask me for my name? Yes. 105 North Tower. That is all? 105 North Tower. You see, monsieur, he remembers nothing. Dr. Manette, do you remember nothing of me? Look at me. Is there no old banker, no old business rising in your mind? Think of England. A man who was your friend. Jarvis Lorry. It's no use. This is what they have done to him. Lucy, come here, my child. Now speak, call him. Speak to him as you did long ago. Oh, Father. Father. Who is this? Oh, Father. Do you remember Dr. Manette? I remember a little girl. Long, golden hair. Ages. Ages ago. What was her name? Her name? She laid her head upon my shoulder when they came for me that night. Don't let them take you, Father. Hush, my child. My baby. My... Lucy. Lucy? Oh... They crossed the channel that night to a safe refuge in England. There for five years the good doctor rested until at last his memory returned and he was well again. But now in the English courts a trial was in progress, the trial of a certain Charles Darnay, accused of plotting treason against his majesty's government. Dr. Manette, called as a witness, sat with his daughter near the judge's bench. The court was hot, humid. Only one man seemed quite at ease, the assistant counsel for the prisoner. His court wig dipped in a slovenly fashion over one eye. His court gown was stained with wine. His name, if anyone was interested, was Sidney Carton. Carton, we must act quickly. With the evidence they have presented, Donnie will hang by morning. Carton, do you hear me? I hear you, Mr. Stryver. Well, what shall I do? If I were you, I'd sit down. Donnie is my client. I'm trying to protect him. I pay you well for your assistance, and I expect to have it. You'll have it, Stryver, when the time comes. I see you've already had your bottle today. <laughs> Two, I believe. You're drunk. <laughs> You're always drunk. Carton, listen to me. At uh, the present time, I'm more interested in Dr. Manette. Dr. Manette, to the stand. <laughs> You are Dr. Manette? I am. Dr. Manette, the prisoner Charles Darnay has been accused of carrying secret messages from Louis of France to spies here in England. Look upon the prisoner, Dr. Manette. Have you ever seen him before? I... I don't know. Really? Is it not true, Dr. Manette, that the prisoner was a fellow passenger with you five years ago on a boat from Calais to Dover? I cannot say. When I came from France that night, I had been newly released from a long imprisonment. I have little remembrance of the occasion. My, my, my mind was a blank for some time. I see. Your daughter made the trip with you, did she not? Yes. And that will be all. Are there any questions from the defense? Any questions, Cotton? No questions. No questions, Your Worship. Miss Lucy Minette to the stand. Now, Miss Minette, look upon the prisoner, please. Have you ever seen him before? Yes. Where? On board the packet boat you mentioned. You spoke to him? You were friendly with him? Yes. Good. Now tell me, did he come aboard alone? No. When the gentleman came on board, he... You mean the prisoner? Yes. Then say the prisoner. When the prisoner came on board, there were two gentlemen with him. But these two did not make the crossing? No. Now tell me. Did you see them give certain papers to the prisoner that night? No. You're sure of that? Well, I... I don't know. It, 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 it was dark. Then they might have given him certain papers, is that right? Yes, but... That'll be all, Miss Bennett. Oh, Manette. but please, I know he isn't guilty. I... That'll be all, please. Are there any questions from the defense? Well, Cotton? No. Cotton, you're mad. No questions. No questions, Your Worship. Your Worship, the prosecution would like to recall its chief witness, the prisoner's accuser, Mr. John Barson. Ah, <laughs> now, Stryver, we might have some questions. Mr. John Barson? Right here, sir. Mr. Barsett, 
Look upon the prisoner. Do you recognize him, Mr. Barson? I do, sir. He's a spy against His Majesty's government. That's what he is. Repeat your reason for that statement. I will. I was on the mail packet that night myself. I saw the kind of papers that passed into his hands. They were lists of our troops. Thank you, Mr. Barson. No more questions. The counsel for defense. Well, Cotton? Ask him these questions I've written down. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Barson. How do you know the papers you saw were lists of British soldiers? I saw them. Oh, you saw them. Then you took them out of the pockets of the prisoner, Charles Darnay? Yes, sir. Uh, no, sir. They fell out, they did. Oh, then you didn't take them. Uh, you're not a spy yourself. A man who makes his living by uh, making accusations? That's a lie, a downright insinuating lie. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, one moment. Well, Cotton? Ah, Striver, you've no imagination. Uh, Mr. Barsad... Where do you get money to live on? My property. Oh, your property. Where is it? I, I don't exactly remember. <laughs> then perhaps you remember how you got that property. I inherited it. From whom? From relatives. Distant relatives. Oh. How many times have you been in prison, Mr. Barsad? Six times, isn't it? What's that got to do with it? You ever been kicked for cheating a dice? Uh, well, now, I Mr. was... Mr. Barsad. You are positive it was the prisoner you saw that night with those lists? I am. It could not possibly have been someone else. No, it couldn't. Uh, Mr. Darnay, you will please face this witness. Now, Mr. Barsad, uh, look at Mr. Darnay. Look at him carefully. Well. And now, Mr. Barsad, look at me. Look at me, the assistant counsel for the defense. Do you notice a resemblance between us? <laughs> Ah, very much alike, aren't we? Uh, well, now that you mention it, you are. As a matter of fact, it could have been me you saw with those supposed lists that night, couldn't it, Mr. Barsad? Uh, well, now I... Couldn't it, Mr. Barsad? All right. Yes. That's all. Thank you. Order, order. Are there any more questions? Jury will retire to consider its verdict. Has the jury agreed? We have, Your Worship. And how do you find the prisoner, Charles Darnay? We find the prisoner not guilty. Mr. Darnay, may we congratulate you, sir? Thank you, Doctor. I'm happy our testimony did you no harm. Oh, thank you, Miss Lucy. I'm sure it did nothing but good. It was Mr. Carton who really won your case. Mr. Carton? Mr. Carton, sir? Uh, did someone call me? May I thank you, sir, for saving my life? Oh, only a part of my business. Uh, Mr. Carton, this is Dr. Manette and Miss Lucy Manette. Mr. Carton? We thought you were splendid, Mr. Carton. Ah, it's nothing. It's just mere professional claptrap. May I ask, sir, how did you happen to notice the resemblance between you and me? Very simple. I, I looked at you and, and admired your bearing and your character, and you see, I've nothing but admiration for myself. <laughs> uh, uh, Lucy, uh, uh, my dear, we must go. Goodbye, Mr. Darnay. Will you call at our house soon? Thank you, Miss Lucy. Uh, and Mr. Carton. Aye. Oh, thank you. Uh, good day, then. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, Doctor. Mr. Carton, would you care to dine with me? You feel you must repay me? Oh, I, I could never repay you for my life, sir. Oh, don't be too certain. A bottle of wine or two, perhaps. My fees are very low. Another glass, Mr. Darnay. Thank you. I've had enough. Enough wine? <laughs> Interesting condition. Well, Mr. Darnay, how does it feel to be alive again, instead of hanging by your neck? Well, I, I'm a little confused regarding time and place, but it's good to feel at home in the world again. It must be an immense satisfaction. For me, the world has nothing to offer except wine like this. So you and I aren't much alike in that particular, are we? Hmm? Hmm, you speak very faintly, Mr. Darnay. I didn't speak at all, sir. Come, Mr. Zane. Why don't you call a health? Give us a toast. What toast, sir? Why, it's on the tip of your tongue, man. I swear it, sir. It's been there all the evening. Out with it. Very well, then. To Miss Lucy Manette. To Miss Manette, then. 
There's a fair young lady to hand into a coach in the dark, eh, Mr. Donny? There's a fair young lady to be pitied by and wept for by. How does it feel, Mr. Donny, hmm? Is it worth being tried for one's life to be the object of such sympathy and compassion? I don't take your meaning, sir. Ah, <laughs> Mr. Donny, let me ask you a question. Do you think I particularly like you? Well, you've acted as if you do, but I don't think you do. I don't think I do either. Nevertheless, I, I hope there's nothing in that dislike to prevent my calling for the reckoning and parting without ill blood. Oh, no, no, nothing at all, no. Do you, do you call the whole reckoning? If I may, sir. In that case, innkeeper, more wine. Yes, sir. Good night, Mr. Carton. Uh, one last word, Mr. Darnay. You think I'm drunk. I think you've been drinking, Mr. Carton. You know I've been drinking. Well, since I must say so, I know it. Ah, you shall likewise know why. I care for no man on earth, and no man cares for me. Much to be regretted. You might have used your talents better. Maybe so, Mr. Zani, maybe not. Good night, sir. Good night. And don't let your sober face elate you. <coughs> for you never know what it may come to. Innkeeper, wine. Coming, sir. Well, Carton, has Mr. Darnay shown you what you've fallen away from? What you might have been? <laughs> Change places with him. And would you have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was? Ah, come on, have it out in plain words. You hate the fellow. Sidney Carton knew it was too late to change his way of life. But he took to brushing his coat and combing his hair. And there were times even when he remembered that a gentleman does not drink himself nightly into a stupor. On Sunday afternoons, he would appear in Miss Manette's garden, sitting quietly, speaking but seldom, for Charles Darnay was there too. One evening, just at dusk, an approaching storm sent them indoors. Oh, listen, it's coming soon, Mr. Darnay. It comes slowly but surely. Isn't it impressive? Sometimes when I've sat here of an evening like this, listening to the thunder in the distance, I've had such a strange fancy. I've imagined that the thunderclaps were echoes, the echoes of footsteps that will one day enter our lives. If that is so, there's a great crowd coming into our lives. I take them into mine, gladly. <laughs> it was my foolish fancy, Mr. Carton. There's a great crowd bearing down upon us now. Thousands upon thousands. Here they come. Fast, fierce and furious. Oh! Oh, you... You make my fancy seem too real, Mr. Carton. There was a great crowd coming into their lives. A numberless, overpowering crowd which one day would decide the fate of these three. At first, it was but a whisper in the city of Paris, a whisper that was to grow with the years into a crashing roar of hatred. Slowly but surely, as the storm came, the crowd was coming too. Up from the cellars of Paris, up from the bare fields of a starving peasantry, the crowd was coming, chanting its hate, screaming for blood. The people of France in all their might rising in revolution. Just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars Ronald Coleman and Edna Best will return in Act Two of A Tale of Two Cities. And now, while we're waiting... Oh, Mr. Uh, Ruick, may I tell you about... About uh, what, Sally? Not what, but who. Whom, Sally? Whom? Oh. oh, yes. Oh, but anyway, I want to tell you about Ma Lena Dietrich. You mean you saw her at Cyril's the other night? Oh, were you there, too? I'd never seen her in person before. Isn't she simply beautiful, Mr. Ruick? And that gorgeous evening gown she was wearing. Trust you to notice that. Well, naturally. And her complexion, Mr. Ruick. No one could help noticing that. It's lovely. You're right, Sally. It's a lovely luxe complexion. Oh, so you know that, too. Well, oh, but did you know that Marlena Dietrich says she always takes an active lather facial every night? <laughs> yes, Sally, I do know that. But here's a chance for you. 
Maybe all the ladies in our audience don't know just how Marlena Dietrich and other famous Hollywood stars take their daily active lather facials. Well, I was coming to that, Mr. Ruick. These active lather facials that Hollywood stars use are so easy and so quick. You just pat Lux Soap's creamy lather lightly into your skin. Rinse with warm water and then with cool. With a towel, you pat your face gently to dry. Then just touch your skin. See if you don't agree with Marlena Dietrich. Here's what she says. Skin feels smoother after an active lather facial with Lux Soap and softer. Thank you, Sally. Now, all you ladies listening in, you who want the charm of a lovely complexion, won't you take a tip from Hollywood's famous stars? Just try active lather facials regularly for 30 days. Get three cakes of Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow and begin giving your own priceless complexion this care that screen stars depend on. You, too, will find these beauty facials with gentle Lux Toilet Soap a wonderful aid in keeping skin exquisitely smooth and soft, appealing. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act Two of A Tale of Two Cities, starring Ronald Coleman as Sidney Carton and Edna Best as Lucy Manette. In La Force Prison, awaiting death by the guillotine, the man called Donnie continues his story. The little seamstress, condemned to die with him within the hour, listens quietly. Her eyes fixed on his face. As time went on, Sidney Carton appeared less and less frequently in the Manette home, for he knew that Lucy loved Charles Darnay. It was in an evening in April, almost ten years ago, that Charles Darnay spoke to Lucy's father. I've only hinted at marriage to Lucy, sir. I, I didn't want to speak until... Well, there are certain things about myself that I feel that you have a right to know. Yes. Dr. Manette, my name is not Darnay. I chose that name when I first left France and my heritage. Heritage? I'm of noble birth, sir, but uh, I don't boast of it. Through generations, my family gained its wealth and its glory at the expense of the poor. When my uncle died, I was the sole remaining heir. I returned to France to sign away my title to the estate. Why do you tell me this? Because, sir, I know what you have suffered at the hands of the French aristocracy. Your uncle's name and yours, what, what was it? saint Evrimond, the Marquis saint Evrimond. He was... Doctor, you're ill, sir. No. That is all you have to say? That is all, sir. Charles, Lucy is not to know what you have just told me. Not now, do you mean? Not now or ever. She is not to know your word. Very well, Doctor. You you have my word. Now go, please. Go. Let's go. Send every mound. <laughs> Send every mound. <laughs> Father. Father, let me in. Father, it's Lucy. Let me in. Oh, please. Lucy, what is it? What's the trouble? Oh, Sidney. I got your message. Is there anything wrong? It's Father. He's been locked in his room all day. Oh, I'm so afraid. Dr. Manette, open the door, Dr. Manette. Miss Lucy, I found a key in the storeroom. Oh, give it to me, will you? And take Miss Lucy downstairs. Yes, sir. Come, my dear, come. Oh. Dr. Manette. Dr. Manette. Do you hear me, Doctor? What work is this you're doing? Walking shoe. It should be finished. Let me... Sidney, is he all right? Yes, he's all right. Dr. Jemison is with him. Oh, you've been very kind to stay so long. I tried to reach Charles, but he wasn't at home. I was so worried. Oh, there's nothing to worry about now. He needs rest. A few days and he'll be well again. What could have caused it? After all these years to, to go back to that. What happened to him? How can we know? A shock, perhaps. Some sudden jolt of memory. A man's mind can play queer tricks. Miss Lucy, 
I brought you a cup of chocolate. Thank you, Miss Pross. And the doctor says everything will be all right. You're not to worry. Oh, thank you. Well... Oh, Sidney, you're not leaving. It's growing late. Not for me, of course, but... Well, I doubt if you see the dawn very often. I don't. But I can welcome it today. A few hours ago, everything was so black and fearsome, and now all my troubles are past, all my hopes reborn. It's always that way, isn't it? There are some hopes a man may have which remain in the shadows forever. Do... Do you have such hopes, Sidney? Oh, oh. No, I am like one who... who died young. Sidney, you've come often to the house in the past few months, and yet we know very little about you, except that you are our friend. Is there nothing that I can do to help, Sidney? Oh, I could never hope to repay what you've already done. May I... May I tell you something? Will you hear me without shrinking from me? What is it? You have been the last dream of my soul. Seeing you here in your home has stirred old shadows that I thought had died out of me. I've heard whispers from old voices impelling me upward that I thought were silent forever. I've had unformed ideas of striving afresh, fighting out the abandoned fight. The dream. All a dream. But I wish you to know that you inspired it. Oh, Sidney, will nothing of it remain? Oh, perhaps as a dream might linger on after the dreamer awakes. But try to hold me in your mind as sincere in this one thing. I would embrace any sacrifice for you or for those dear to you. Think now and then that there is a man who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you. Poor fool, Carton, drunk, <laughs> this time with self-pity. From that day on, he was seen rarely in the Manette home. He was there when Lucy and Danny were married, and again some years later when their child was born, a girl. But his visits were short, and he would slip away at the first opportunity. In France, during these years, the echoing footsteps of the crowd had been growing louder. Grim patriots who were to bathe the soil of France in the blood of the hated nobility. And then the storm broke in all its fury. In July 1789, they swarmed from the rat holes of Paris to cover the country with a blanket of red. An army of vengeance bent upon destruction and death. The Bastille has fallen! The Bastille is ours! On, citizens! On! How can you sit and it so calmly on this day, our day of victory? Our day of victory will come when every noble head has rolled from every noble shoulder. And in this knitting I have inscribed their names. The names of those who have starved us, beaten us, killed us. And for every stitch another head shall roll. For every stitch we shall be avenged. What do you want at this hour? I'm looking for Mr. Sidney Carton. The inn is not open. There's no inn in London open at this time of night. I want to see Mr. Sidney Carton. Let me in. Now, where is he? He's in there. Carton. Huh? Carton, wake what? up. What? Wake up. Who is it? Darnay. Oh, Mr. Darnay. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Darnay. You... You'll have some wine? I've no time for that. Listen to me. I'm leaving for Paris within the hour. Paris? Yes. There's some business there that I must attend to at once. Paris? It's very warm this time of the year. If I were your lawyer, I should advise against the journey. How much do you know of me? <laughs> this is excellent wine, Mr. Darnay. French wine. From the cellars of the aristocrats who fled the country. There will be few of these bottles left now. It's being poured into the streets of Paris along with the blood of the nobles who once drank it. 
Must you go to Paris, Mr. Darnay? I see there's little I have to explain to you. But I received a letter this morning from a man who was once my servant. They have threatened to send him to the guillotine unless he can explain why he's in possession of certain property. That's why I must go, to save his life. And what of your own life? Oh, I'll be in, in no danger. I, I've renounced my inheritance. It's easily proved. Hmm. Well, why do you come to me? There's no one else I can turn to. I don't know how long I shall be gone, how long my, my family shall be alone. In my absence, I should like to feel that there's someone here in London who's watching over them. I? You would trust me to watch over your child, your wife? Yes. I know that you love her. When did you say you must leave? Tonight, now. Have no fear about your family. They will be safe. Thank you, Carton. Good night. Good night. Godspeed. Mr. Carton, more wine, sir? No, take it away. Halt! You there in the coach. Where are you going, citizen? I'm going to Paris. Let me see your papers. Well, if you'll hurry, please, citizen. I must be in Paris within the hour. What is your name, citizen? Charles Darnay. Darnay! Also known as Evremond. Why, yes, but I... I... You are consigned, Evremond, to the prison of La Force. <laughs> After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille and our stars Ronald Coleman and Edna Best will return for Act Three of A Tale of Two Cities. And now here's a pretty young lady in a most unusual state of mind. Phew, what a day. Am I tired? Lucky I haven't got a date tonight. I'm simply not going to stir out of this door tonight for anyone. Hello? Yes? Why, Dick! It's you. You're on leave? Dancing? I'd love to. Half an hour. Of course I'll be ready. Oh, my. Dick home from camp. I've just got to look my best. Let's see. Get out my new shoes. Blue dress, little hat with veil. Now, quick like a flash, fill up the tub. Unwrap a cake of Lux soap. Thank goodness for my beauty bath. I'll feel like new in ten minutes. Now, there's a clever girl. Jean depends on her Lux soap bath for a real beauty pickup. She'll relax a few minutes in the warm water, and she'll smooth on the rich Lux soap lather. Lather so creamy and caressing that it seems to soothe away the day's tiredness. When she steps out of her Lux soap bath, she'll be refreshed. And most important of all, she'll be sure of daintiness, too. You see, Lux soap has active lather that carries away perspiration and every trace of dust and dirt. It leaves skin sweet, ele exquisitely fresh. Did you know that famous green stars use this fine complexion soap as their daily bath soap, too? Yes, lovely ladies everywhere protect daintiness the easy Lux soap way. You will enjoy the luxury of this beauty bath. You'll be delighted, too, with the delicate flower-like fragrance that Lux leaves on your skin. Buy this fragrant white soap, the economical three cakes at a time way. Get some Lux toilet soap tomorrow. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. It's curtain time for the third act of A Tale of Two Cities. The sun rises slowly over the roofs of Paris, and the long shadow of the guillotine falls against the walls of La Force prison. In the cell of the condemned, the man speaks in a hushed voice. His story meant only for the ears of the little seamstress. They brought Charles Darnay here to La Force prison to be held in secret. In secret? But somehow the news filtered back to England, and soon his wife and child were in Paris with Dr. Manette and Mr. Lorry. Mr. Lorry? Their old friend. For months they waited for some word from Darnay in his cell, but no word came. And every day through the streets the tumbrils passed, filled with condemned, on their last journey to the guillotine. Father, did you see him? Did you see Charles? No, 
they would not take me to his cell. But I have news. Yes? Charles is summoned tomorrow for trial. Tomorrow? Oh, Father. I think it will go well, my child. They are going to allow me to testify for you. You? But they'll brand you a traitor. They'll kill you, Father. No, my child. I bear a charmed life in this city. I have been a prisoner in the Bastille. <laughs> Dr. Manette, is this tribunal to understand that you endorse the accused, the prisoner, Charles Evremont? That is so. But he is of noble blood. He is a traitor. He is no traitor. I will swear to it. Dr. Manette, we know your life, the cause you fought for. You are one of us. Yes, and as one of you, I speak. The accused, Charles Evremont, was my first friend when I was released from the Bastille. The accused, Charles Evremont, was my daughter's husband. In all these years, he has had no part in the tyranny against which we fought. He has renounced his share of the estate and returned it to the people. Charles Evremond is no enemy of the revolution. I give you my word, he is innocent. Free the prisoner! Dr. Bombay says he is innocent! Free him! Is the jury ready to declare itself? We are. How say you then? Let the prisoner be free! Wait! Wait, I say! The prisoner cannot be freed! Citizeness Defarge, what does this mean? I say the prisoner cannot be freed! He still stands accused! By whom, Citizeness? By three voices! By my husband, Ernest Defarge! By myself! And the third? By the doctor of Beauvais! Dr. Alexander Manette. I protest, I protest. Continue, citizeness. Hear me, all of you. Dr. Manette, you have said Charles Ebramon was your first friend. I was your first friend. It was to my wine shop you were brought where you made shoes under my care. You knew yourself then only as a number. 105 North Tower, the cell in which you had been confined. Is that not true? If you say it is, I must believe it. I can't remember. But I remembered. And I resolved one day to examine that cell. And on the day the Bastille fell, I went to 105 North Tower. Hear me, citizens! In that cell, hidden in the stonework of the wall, I found a paper. A paper written by Dr. Alexander Manette in the year 1767, before the dark and loneliness drove him mad. It is that paper I hold in my hand now. Shall I tell you what it says? It describes, in the doctor's words, how he was called one night to attend a peasant family. A girl lay dying in a miserable bed of rags. A girl and her unborn child. In the stable, her brother, with a sword wound in his chest, was to breathe his last before the morning. And why? Because these two unfortunate creatures had protested against the noble family who held them in bondage, had protested against the murder of the girl's father and her husband, killed by this same noble hand. The good doctor buried the girl and her brother the following day, but he had seen too much, had heard too much from the lips of that dying girl. That night the doctor was taken to the Bastille without a trial and without a word in defense. The noble family had silenced him forever. In the name of that family, the name of those murderers, Son Nevermond! Yes, you heard the name, Ramon. And now hear this. Listen to the words of Dr. Alexander Manette himself. The words he wrote. I, Alexander Manette, prisoner of the Bastille, having thus set forth the causes of my imprisonment, do denounce the Marquis San Evermond and his descendants against the time when these crimes shall be answered for. I denounce them to heaven and earth. No, stop. You ask me to stop. Listen to me. I have long had the crimes of the Evermond family knitted in my register. Ask my husband, is that so? It is so. On the great day when the Bastille fell, I brought this paper home and we read it together, my husband and I. Ask him, is that so? It is so. Then, when we had finished, I told him that I had a secret to communicate with him. I told him what it was. 
I struck this bosom of his two hands as I strike it now, and I said, Defarge, I was brought up among the fishermen of the seashore, and that peasant family so injured by the Ebramans is my family. That sister of the mortally wounded boy upon the ground was my sister. That husband was my sister's husband. That unborn child was their child. That brother was my brother. Those dead are my dead. And that summons to answer for those things descends to me. Ask him, is that so? It is so. Then tell wind and fire to stop. But don't tell me. <laughs> what say you now, citizens? Does this ever one go free? <laughs> Back to the prison of La Force to await death by the guillotine. That was the sentence passed by the tribunal. That same night, a coach left Calais for Paris, carrying but one passenger, slouched low in the seat, his shabby greatcoat pulled high about his neck. Reaching Paris, he haunted the inns and taverns, wandered like a lonely ghost through the city, and at last made his way to the lodging house, where Lucy waited news from La Force. Sydney, Sydney Carton. You must forgive my coming at this hour. I didn't wish to be seen. I knew you'd come. I've been waiting. Sydney, they're going to take Charles. They're going to kill him. How long has he? Until the morning. And they won't let me see him. I can't be near him in these last hours. Ah, Lucy, remember what you said long ago, the dark hours before the dawn. There will be no dawn tomorrow. It will be dark now, always. Lucy, if only there was some way I could comfort you, you must hope... What hope is there? What comfort? My husband is going to die. Lucy. Oh, Sydney, forgive me. You were right. I have no strength to offer you. You came to us tonight. I shall never forget that. I tell you, it is useless to speak to Dr. Manette. He is in no condition to see you now. Mr. Lorry, if you will forgive me... There is nothing you can do here, Mr. Carton, nothing. Mr. Lorry, you are a man of business, are you not? I am. Well, I am here on business. Oh, really, sir? Oh, I know your opinion of me, Mr. Lorry. But a drinking man may learn things around the town, if he can listen at the same time. I have learned that Dr. Manette is in great danger. He and Lucy must leave Paris tonight. Leave Paris? And they must take the child with them. But, but why? The revenge of Madame Defarge does not stop with Charles. The accusation is against the Marquis saint Evremond and all his race. Lucy, her child. Ah. Now, may I see Dr. Manette? It would do no good, sir. He's gone back to his work. His work? He wouldn't even know what you were saying, Mr. Carton. Mr. Lorry, you have a pass that will let you through to Calais? Will it serve for Dr. Manette and Lucy? Yes, for as many as are with me. Then you will use it tonight. You will arrange for a coach to meet you all here at midnight. The coach will take you to the side gate of La Force Prison. Do you understand? The prison. There you will be joined by another person who will make the trip with you to England. Don't stop to ask questions. Proceed at once to the gates of Paris and on to Calais as fast as the coach can take you. But this, this other person, who will it be? Who? <laughs> Mr. Sidney Carton. I don't understand. Oh, I may be in poor condition for travel. <laughs> I usually am at that hour. But as soon as I am in the coach, drive on. But you, at the gate of La Fosse, will you be within the, pad the prison tonight? Yes. Yes, I'm going to see Charles. A certain Mr. Barsad. English spy is a turnkey in the prison. He will open the doors for me. I, I don't understand all this, but you give me hope. And you will save them all, Mr. Lorry. Not only I, sir. I shall have a young and ardent man at my side. Yes, with the help of heaven, you shall. Tell me, Mr. Lorry, yours is a long life to look back on. I'm in my 78th year, sir. Ah, you've been useful all your life. Trusted, respected. 
There are many in this world who would miss you. Oh, a solitary old bachelor. No, there is nobody to weep for me. Wouldn't she weep for you? Mm. Lucy, yes, thank God. I didn't quite mean what I said. It is a thing to thank God for, isn't it? Surely, surely. If you had to say with truth tonight, I have gained the love of no human creature. I have done nothing good or serviceable to be remembered by. Your 78 years would be 78 heavy curses, would they not? I think they would. But you are young, Carton. Yes, I'm not old. But the road I took was never the way to age. Good night, Mr. Lorry. How long before Danny is taken from his cell and put with the others? I can't tell that. Perhaps only an hour now. All right. Leave us alone, Bass. All right. Leave us alone, Bassad. But stay within call. You'll keep your promise. I told you that I could get you in and out again. But for you both to try to leave... I, I know, would... I know. Open the door. Open the door. Open the door. Who's there? Have you come for... Carton, you... <laughs> Of all the people on earth, I'm the least expected, is that it? Why are you here? I came to see you. Oh, you shouldn't have taken the risk. It can serve no purpose. It can serve one. I bring you a message from Lucy. A message? A request, rather. That you do exactly as I say and ask no questions. Now, take off your coat. Take off my... Yes. Take it off and change it for mine. Quickly. Are you mad? Ah, do as I say. It's her wish. Very well. Now, put on my coat. And your hair, rumple it. So, as mine is. Carton, there's no escaping from this place. You'll only die with me. It's madness. Have I mentioned escape? Oh, do as I say. Now, take my cravat. Here. Give me yours. Carton, I warn you, oh, you no, can't. Be, be quiet. Shh. Look, there are pen and ink on that table. Is your hand steady enough to write? It was when you came in. Well, steady it then. And write what I dictate. Quickly. To whom do I address it? Oh, to no one. Write. If you remember the words that passed between us long ago, you will understand when you see this. Have you written that? Well, I, I don't... What, what vapor is that? Vapor? There's a strange odor, something, something that crossed me. I'm not conscious of it. Take up the pen and finish. I told you once... There was nothing I would not do. Nothing that I... I, I would not... Now, what is it? There is something, that, that odor. You mean this on my handkerchief? Yes, yes, it's so... It's... I, I breathe deeply. No, breathe. no, 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 I... Yes, breathe. <sighs> but breathe. I, I can't, I... Breathe. I... Oh. You, down there, Basset. Are you finished? Are you ready to... What's this? What's the matter with him? There's nothing. He's unconscious. Carry him out to the gate. But you... You changed clothes with him. Listen to me. Sidney Carton fainted from the shock of parting with an old friend. You'll find a coach at the side gate. Put him into it. Tell them to drive as fast as they can to Calais. No, wait. Wait. I'll finish this note. If you remember the words that passed between us, you will understand I told you once there was nothing I would To keep a life you love beside you. God bless you. For your sweet compassion. Here, take this note and hurry. Who are you? Jarvis Lorry from Telson's Bank. Past. Dr. Manette. Past. His daughter. Past. His grandchild. Who's that on the floor? He. He's Mr. Sidney Carton. Let me see him. Sidney Carton, eh? Past. Open the gate. Let this coach go through. <laughs> on their way now. 
and perhaps by this time they have reached Calais, are bound for England and home. Then you, you are Sidney Carton. Yes. And you're dying for him, for Charles Downey. And for someone else. Aristocrats, your carriage is awaiting. Six tumbrils will carry the day's wine till I'm my dumb like guillotine. God, take them out! You, Evremond, it will be as I promised for you. You shall wait for the last tumbrel. Your head shall be the 52nd today. I am ready. Move along there! Move along! Mr. Carton, may I... May I go with you? Keep your eyes on me, child. Mind nothing else. I mind nothing while I hold your hand. thing that I do than I have ever done. It's a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. Sidney Carton has found his destiny, and the roar of the crowd fades into the silence of 150 years ago. We saw it all through the magic of some fine acting, and the stars responsible for that return to the stage now. Ronald Coleman and Edna Best. Thank you, CB. And on behalf of Edna and myself, I'd like to thank the other members of the cast tonight for their excellent work. Isn't this one of the largest casts you've ever had, Mr. DeMille? One of the largest and one of the best, Edna. We've been planning this production for several years. It must have been that long ago we first talked about it, wasn't it, Ronnie? I believe it was, C.B. I know I've been looking forward to it for a long time. It's always been my favorite among your pictures, Ronnie. Quote any line from the Dickens novel, Edna, and Ronnie can give you chapter and verse. I should say so, and I hope soon to be on with the quiz, kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's one quiz anyone can pass, Mr. DeMille. At least anyone who knows about Lux Soap. The question of the right complexion care. For me, it's been Lux Soap for years now. And I find it's a grand help in keeping skin soft and smooth. Go to the head of the class, Edna. Lux Soap is always the right answer. <laughs> Who's going to be here next week, Mr. DeMille? First, let me tell you the play. It's the CB. Play. Good night. Good night. Good night. Charles <laughs> Dickens will be proud of both of you. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Lana Turner and Lionel Barrymore in The Devil and Miss Jones. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Heard in tonight's play were Werner Felton as Madame Defarge, Griff Barnett as Dr. Manette, and Kathleen Fitz, Alex Harford, Victor Rodman, Edwin Max, Boyd Davis, Jeff Corey, Thomas Mills, Ferdinand Munier, Arthur Q. Bryan, Don Thompson, Jane Morgan, Charles Seal, Eric Snowden, and Tory Carlton. Tune in next Monday night to hear Lionel Barrymore and Lana Turner in The Devil and Miss Jones. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>